And the main thing here is to connect with your positive motivation, as well as to settle the body and mind. And so pick one physical sensation to focus on in order to focus the mind. So it might be the sensation at the soles of your feet or the sensation of breathing at your abdomen where the air passes in and out of your nostrils. But just pick one simple physical sensation to be with. Okay, so we're looking at the four seals and we're looking at the four seals as a way of understanding reality. And then what you do with that reality is up to you. If you're interested to practice, if you're interested in just intellectualizing, if you're just feeling like I want to make the, the day a bit easier, or if I want to make the life a bit easier, or if I want to make the world a bit easier, that's really up to you. Um, if you think in terms of future lives, that's up to you. But it's an interesting kind of philosophical landscape to explore, and it's a very uniquely Buddhist presentation. Um, I think a lot of world religions and a lot of philosophies have shared ideas about ethics, for example, ethics of non harmfulness, you know, don't kill, don't steal, stuff like that. Um, a lot of religions have shared ideas about the importance of kindness and compassion and cats <laughs> and things like that. But I think what's unique to Buddhism is the view. And again, you don't have to take it on board, but it's an interesting and unique way of looking at reality that isn't shared by other faith traditions. So just, you know, grain of salt, see what lands, see what doesn't. And uh, if you have questions about it or interesting ideas arise from it, maybe we can talk about those as well. For those of you that have studied maybe Greek philosophy, there will be some points of resonance, some points of familiarity, but it's not quite that, but there is, you know, some uh, similarities for sure. So we've been looking at the four seals and we're now getting into the one that's kind of the most intriguing and the most unique to Buddhism. So just to review, um, when we say the four seals, we're talking about seals like how a notary marks a document as authentic. So these four systems or tenant systems in Buddhism each have four seals or views that mark them as authentic Buddhist doctrine. So if they don't have these four, they're not Buddhist. Doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're not Buddhist unless they have these four. So the first one is all products are impermanent. They change moment to moment. So anything that comes together is going to fall apart. Anything that is produced is subject to change. And that's not necessarily good news or bad news. It's just one of the attributes of produced phenomena. So knowing that you enjoy the good and don't get attached, knowing that you don't get so worried about the bad because you know it's going to shift, etc. The second one is that all contaminated things are miserable. So contaminated by karma, disturbing emotions like anger, anything contaminated by negative states of mind and by karma is going to be suffering, is going to be what's called dukkha. And it's good to know that that's why the suffering is there. It's not a punishment. It's not even an inevitability. It's just that if things are contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions, they're going to be painful. And then the, new, the one that we haven't looked at is all phenomena are selfless. They lack an inherent identity. So um, if you were in previous classes with maybe Young Zee Rinpoche or with Jordan, and maybe he was showing some videos with Kajala, you've explored this a little bit. So we'll go a bit more into it. But uh, these are the first three. These are called the marks of existence. And the fourth seal is basically nirvana is peace. So if you cut karma and disturbing emotions, 
your mind is in a state beyond sorrow. So the first three make you think the fourth is really important, really intriguing, really interesting, and something that I want to develop within my own mind stream. Or it's just interesting information objectively. So this is the one we're looking at. All phenomena are empty and selfless. They lack an inherent identity. So when you see that, just have a little feeling about what's the implication? What's the implication of that statement in my daily life, on a good day, on a bad day, in my relationships, in my moods, whatever? All phenomena are empty and selfless. Empty of what? Empty of inherent existence. Empty of inherent existence. This is the key word because sometimes we say things are empty, things are selfless, and we don't finish the sentence because we're used to this way of thinking if we're in kind of Eastern philosophical circles, but it's important to remember the rest of the sentence. They're empty of inherent existence. Okay, so when you're sitting with that concept, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? What's the what's the implication of everything being empty and selfless? Say you're, I don't know, stuck in the grocery store. It's a long line. There's screaming children. There's harassed looking parents. There's grumpy cashiers. All phenomena are empty and selfless. The cashier, myself, the groceries, the whole situation. What does that do for your mind? What is the implication of thinking something like that? Does it make a difference? Does it have anywhere to land? <laughs> the, it's the, a lot of space. Space. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It gives a lot of space to even consider what have I decided this moment means? Doesn't it? Because without remembering emptiness, we take our initial opinion as absolute truth. Like this is a stressful situation or this is a fun situation. And it feels self-evident, it feels obvious, it feels natural, and everyone probably agrees. As soon as you remember that it lacks inherence or that the whole scene does not exist from its own side, then there is that space, like you said, and the space can suggest or invite play. It can also invite calm. You can decide this is the display of life's rich pageant, or this is a, a lesson for me about the chaos of our inner world kind of bleeding out into our outer world. And isn't it so poignant how sentient beings suffer May they be free of their suffering. You know, you can decide that the scene means any number of things. It can remind you of your childhood with humor, can remind you of your childhood with angst. It can remind you of your own parents. It can remind you of so many different things. But when you're not remembering a big picture of any kind, then it feels inevitable to feel the way you feel. The scene is stressful, therefore I am stressed as if those were rock hard things that had no wiggle room. So remembering the view immediately does open up possibilities and it also gives your mind a chance to be flexible. Even just to think not from its own side, is it stressful? My habits, my conditioning have made this appear stressful and now I'm engaging with it as if it's stressful and now I'm stressed but nothing has made me stressed about this event. I made myself stressed by labeling it a certain way and believing in that. So that's very surface level starting to understand this concept, but is it is it sort of making sense? Did I lose you? Yeah. Good, good, okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting because also you can go too far right? Can you already feel the potential to go too far and to say, well, if everything is empty of inherent existence, that means everything could be anything and maybe everything is nothing. And you immediately fall into one of the two extremes of nihilism or 
you know, eternalism, permanence, however you want to frame that. So if you don't understand emptiness precisely, if you don't understand this middle way view, then playing with this idea, you start to tip into something that's really unskillful. And maybe you even have seen this in yourself or seen this in friends of yours where they say, even just kind of benignly, oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. And you're like, is it? <laughs> is it all good? Right? What about, you know, children dying of starvation down the street? What about, you know, people without houses having to camp in the park? Is, is that good? You know, you can see how if you misunderstand the view, it starts to, to harm your ethical sort of way of being. It can start to harm your compassion. And that means you've misunderstood. So if you've started to play with the idea of things being empty of inherent existence and your compassion is less and your ethics feel more, I guess, flexible in the wrong way, then you've misunderstood the view. Yeah. So it's interesting, but you can see how it could sort of tip, right? That you start to see the flexibility of things and say, okay, this is not a stressful event in a grocery store. How about this is just an event with many people in it? And I could choose to connect with humanity or separate from humanity mentally in this moment. I could choose to be enjoying the chaos around me. I could choose to even see that it's not chaos from another perspective. I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, I could do that. Playing, interesting, useful. Going into calling something bad good or something good bad, it's getting into danger land. So the view is very precise, but um, I think if you know that litmus test of if you feel yourself losing compassion or you feel yourself at risk of harming your ethics, you've gone too far and you're tipping into nihilism or some sort of eternalism. Yeah. Thoughts so far? Good, yeah. More, okay. Okay, more context. Okay, so all phenomena are empty and selfless. They're empty or selfless of inherence or independence or divorced from context, however you want to frame it. It's important to realize that this view is the Prasangika view. There is many ways of understanding the third seal. The third seal is held by all Buddhist systems, but the way they think the view is, is going to vary. So for us, we start with the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, who lived, you know, 2,600 years ago, was a real person in Nepal slash India, depending on where you put the border. And, you know, he was a real person. He really enlightened himself. And he went on to teach. And his students taught and became enlightened and taught and became enlightened. And there's a whole lineage. So we kind of fast forward to the second century, where Nagarjuna, uh, really understood emptiness very precisely. And he's who we call the founder of this middle way school that we belong to in our tradition. And then, you know, a few centuries later, we have a Sangha who thought he clarified the view when in fact he went a little bit too far and created what's called now the mind only school, which is very much like it sounds. Everything comes from the mind. And that is mostly true, but not as true as he framed it from our perspective. And together with him was Vasubandhu, who had a similar idea. It's all from the mind. It's all from the mind. A little bit too simplistic in one sense. Although if you can get your head around this view, it can be really interesting and useful. You just don't want to stay there forever. So then in the sixth century, we had Buddha Palita, who was a proponent of the Middle Way Autonomous School, but then was defeated by Baba Viveka. And this autonomous consequentialist division is a very subtle division, but basically they're all Middle Way proponents. 
And we think that Chandrakirti had his head around the, the best, most precise view. And then Lama Tsongkhapa more recently in the 14th century. And of course, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who's still alive today. So we follow these four for the most part, although we respect the ones in the middle a great deal. So why am I telling you all this like history lesson? <laughs> okay, why am I telling you a history lesson? It's important to know that within Buddhism, that one little sentence, all phenomena are empty and selfless, is interpreted many different ways. And a lot of those different ways that it's interpreted, the Buddha taught, he taught it many different ways. So it's not like people's um, schisming of a doctrine into their own personal views, although that happens. In Buddhism, the Buddha taught to the audience in front of him. He was very skillful about understanding, okay, the people in this room are gonna progress if I give them this step. And then tomorrow's people in tomorrow's room will progress if I give them this giant step. And he really was able to read the room and see who needed what. So he even taught things that eventually sound slightly contradictory, but because they were moving the people he was teaching in the right direction, he explained them in that way. So some of the differences in the philosophical tenant schools come from that, the Buddha teaching many different ways to move you towards this wisdom that understands reality. So it means also that if someone has an affinity for one of these different philosophical schools, it doesn't mean they're wrong. Just like people in other religions aren't necessarily wrong. Like if there's a basis of ethics, it's moving in the right direction. Who are we to say what is best for anyone? If there is good ethics of non-harmfulness, proceed. The rest is really a personal decision. So the Buddhist tenant systems, you know, if you go into even different traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, it, there might be a slight difference. Definitely there'll be a difference if you go into the Thai tradition or Bur Burmese tradition, but it's moving in the right direction. And what my teachers have always explained to me is think of the tenants like a ladder or like stair steps. And when you get to the top of the lower one, you'll see the higher one is coming. So even if you start with a lower view, once you get to the top of that view, you'll see there's more work to be done. And then you get to the top of that one and see, oh, there's another peak to achieve. And so you'll be led in the right direction. And it doesn't really matter if you're not totally tidy in your view just yet, as long as it's kind of underpinned by this ethical system. The only wrong way is nihilism. Oh, yeah. I I just have a question. Um, uh, I thought um, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Buddha Palita were all sort of in the same camp. And uh, um, yeah. That's yeah, it. yeah. Buddha Palita was in the same camp, except he wasn't as good a debater. <laughs> And so, so he got kind of like squashed for a little bit. Okay. And, you know, and then later Chandrakirti was like, no, Baba Viveka was right. Yeah. So certainly Baba Viveka had many good things to say. He just wasn't as uh, kind of upskilled in his debating abilities. So in his lifetime, his view didn't have the same oomph. Yeah. So eventually he converted to the consequentialist view. I mean, we could, we could say that loosely. Uh, I think he, you know, who's to know what he did in his own developmental process? Generally, we say Baba Viveka was an autonomist, but the autonomist consequentialist distinction is quite a subtle one. No, Buddha Palita, I'm yeah. talking. Yeah. You said Baba Viveka. Oh, sorry, Buddha Palita. Yes, you're right. He was a consequentialist. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to explore some of these things. Um, you know, of course, the timeline I gave you was the short version. There's a much longer version. Other traditions have other key figures that pop in. Um, I think it's interesting to see also the way in which Buddhism kind of gets untidy and disperses and weaves in with other things. And then someone will become enlightened and kind of tidy it up and patch it back up again. Right. So it kind of like starts to get watered down and then it gets tidied back up and watered down and tidied back up. And it's happening even in this day and age. And you see, you know, maybe Buddhism mixed with psychology in a way that's helpful. Buddhism mixed with psychology in a way that's indulgent. 
right? And you have to use your own discernment to figure out when is it skillful, when is it not? You know, or Buddhism mixed with some, I don't know, indigenous wisdom of the people of your area, the First Nations people of your area might be very healthy or mixed in a way that just is kind of cherry picking the bits that are the easiest to digest and making your own religion out of what is palatable as opposed to what is moving you along the spiritual path. So it's an interesting thing to kind of sit with that really you need your own inner guru very engaged. You need your own inner wisdom and your trust in your own inner wisdom very engaged when you're meeting with these teachings to really hear, does it have the ring of truth for me as an individual? And if so, what's the consequence of that? What's the conclusion or behavior or change that needs to happen? So when we're looking at emptiness and wanting to develop a wisdom that realizes emptiness, why do we even want to do that? What's the point of that? Besides just a more spacious, flexible mind, what's the deeper purpose, do you think, of this teaching? I'm guessing you know you're just feeling shy. Well, in order to help others most effectively, you have to eliminate all the obscurations in your own mind, and you can only do that through emptiness. Emptiness is the main assistant for sure. Um, that Yeah, that's very true. Even, you know, foundational vehicle arhats also want to realize emptiness, even for their own sake. Why? Why does it help you as an individual to realize emptiness? My happiness. And, Definitely. Um, and um, understanding the compassion for others. That's fine. Yeah, definitely that's important. That's really important. Yeah, thank you. Most important for me is that my happiness, if you understand emptiness, and you should not get attached to things. And, uh, yeah, that's a really key point that it really helps with your management of your own attachment. So when we're talking about what is kind of the initial or main or yeah, yeah, main purpose for realizing emptiness of inherent existence, it's to cut the root of samsara. It's to cut the root of cyclic existence. It's to stop this repetitive cycle of negative habits, basically. So the only way to interrupt fundamentally at the root the negative habits we keep doing mentally and the way that that causes us to cycle through uncontrolled rebirth to uncontrolled rebirth is to realize emptiness directly. Because it stands in direct opposition to why we're in samsara in the first place. So we're in samsara or cyclic existence, uncontrolled rebirth because of ignorance of reality. Ignorance of the reality of the self, ignorance of the reality of all phenomena. We are very fundamentally confused, but that confusion is fixable. That's really good news, right? The confusion is fixable. We can achieve wisdom, and that very wisdom cuts the ignorance, and we stop doing the same old thing. So you need to realize emptiness for your own sake, for your own sake, to cut your own suffering, to cut your own negative habitual tendencies, to finish your pain. And hopefully you do that for the bigger reason of in order to continue to develop, to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things, which really means that you've developed all of your qualities also to their utmost extent, so much so that you know what people need in a precise way. What's the way to help them help themselves? Right. Yeah, go ahead. All right, because um, so just thinking, uh, listening to everything, and I'm confused because go back to that situation in the supermarket, right? And you used to, and you're talking about being, um, you know, finding the middle, that middle place where you're detached, but in some way, you, you to not lose your empathy, you have to have some, it's that fine line of having a, 
if you're completely detached, then you're not going to feel and have empathy, but to somehow find that spot where you're attached and detached, and to find your peace in that, I think that to me is what that's the work. That there's okay. a sorrow, and I'm in all of that and just present here. So I can feel empathy. Um, because if I lost that, then I wouldn't have it anymore, but still to be detached enough that it doesn't consume. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when we're talking about emptiness, we're only taught in the wisdom realizing emptiness, we're only talking about one side of the path. The other side of the path is all the method things like empathy, compassion, loving kindness, patience, all the good warm things that are universally understood to be beneficial. And we kind of call them like the two wings of practice, like a bird needs two wings to fly to enlightenment. So we would say that compassion without the wisdom understanding emptiness becomes imprecise, it becomes biased, it becomes partial, um, it is loaded with expectations, and it becomes a little bit like a business deal. If I'm nice to you, you should be nice to me, right? And it can get too simplistic or, you know, too self-serving. So compassion without wisdom is not as strong. And then wisdom, very much like what you're describing, wisdom without compassion can be too detached, right? It can be too, you know, separated from and distant from. But when we say detached, we mean non-attachment. We don't mean disengaged. We don't at all mean disengaged. When we say detachment, what we mean is getting rid of attachment. Attachment in Buddhism has nothing to do with the word we use it in colloquial language or in psychology. You know, like attachment parenting or a secure attachment style or all of those things in, in just regular psychology are positive, right? It means you can form bonds and connections with people. In Buddhism, attachment basically means exaggerating. So you see the good in something, the good in someone, the good in some object, you see the benefit of it in a relative way, but then attachment takes that information and twists it. It says it is good in and of itself divorced from context, or they are good separated from the days when they're not so good and the days when they're downright bad and this whole grand spectrum and only from one perspective are they good, blah, 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 blah. It takes things in isolation and it also thinks the good exists from the side of the person or the object rather than you labeling good on the basis of their behavior or something. Yeah, so when we're trying to practice detachment or non-attachment, what we're trying to do is to see the biggest picture possible, which actually increases your compassion. But it makes your compassion more equanimous. You don't think, for the people I like, lots of compassion. For the people I don't like, no compassion. You, you can still hold a reasonable worldly opinions like, these people I don't have rapport with, I don't understand or relate to that well. May they be well, may they be happy right? These people I understand quite well, I relate to, I love, I have rapport with. May they be well, may they be happy. Yeah, you're trying to have an even keel. You're trying to have a really broad and open mind, regardless of what people's individual level of closeness with you feels like. You're not letting that mandate your goodwill. Yeah, your own opinions and judgments about people. You're deciding not to let that dictate how much goodwill they get or how much compassion they get. And the way of settling into that, one is to remember just impermanence, the way relationships and people and minds change. Another is to remember the way in which things exist in, in context with your own individual experience. So behavior that feels Familiar, fun, polite to you is not necessarily the same behaviors that feel that way to someone else. It's coming from your own perspective, your own history, your own process of labeling. And even deeper than that, trying to think these whole categories lack inherence. They exist, but not in and of themselves. So that type of spaciousness opens up more pathways of empathy for more people. 
Because when you realize that not understanding emptiness is a lot of why people act up and behave badly and cause suffering to themselves and others, the poignance of that strikes you in such a way your compassion can even be elevated by remembering emptiness. And that is definitely what we want to happen. So kind of in the beginning-ish, you know, and it might not feel like you're in the beginning of your path, have you been practicing your whole life and many lifetimes, but it's nice to identify as a beginner just to keep the mind open. When you're in a beginner mind, you can think of these as two different skills that you want to marry up. The skill of wisdom that understands the emptiness of inherent existence, the skill of compassion that genuinely wants people to be free of their suffering. And then you start to bring them together, realizing that they suffer because of their ignorance, not understanding emptiness, right? And that when you understand emptiness, you stop suffering and you can be of more benefit and you bring them together. But in the beginning, it helps to kind of work on them as different thought projects. And then in daily life, which one gets emphasized maybe is more intuitive, what seems to be relevant to this moment in this time, and you can kind of trust yourself. How does that sit? Does that? Make... Yeah, go ahead. So what I'm hearing is that actually another uh, word for me about the emptiness is clarity. And when I see clearly, it's a spontaneous experience of compassion. It's not something I have to put on top, clarity births and gives an opportunity like a, some ground for all of those beautiful feelings of compassion and, and genuine connection and just that human understanding of what a trip this is. When I'm not seeing clearly, I go to all the other, the judgment, all the meaning, you know, and I forget that what I'm experiencing really is my meaning. Yeah. And so I know now that if I'm not feeling those genuine, spontaneous, uh, warm feelings of connection, then I'm, then I'm not seeing clearly. That's already an indication that I'm off. Yeah. Yeah. But it's everything. That's the emptiness. That That's what clarity shows me. Wow. Don't put your spin on it or recognize what your spin is the meaning you've brought to this situation. Yeah, yeah. Reality, you know, so I love that. I love yeah. that. Can I, ask a, I love that. can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Um, going back to your example at the very beginning with the grocery store, it would seem to me that if you were enlightened, it would be automatic how you would deal with that situation. So what happens to me in those situations, which may be more apt to be driving a car down the road and anger, is I think through this and, and it calms me down. Now, adding the element of compassion for those people, it's so if I'm busy saying to myself that there is, this phenomenon is, em is empty, that this really doesn't exist as I'm seeing it or feeling it, and I need to realize that then how do I function to, let's say there's people and I should be, let's say somebody's running into the street or something like that, or an accident could happen and I'm going to jump in between, but it's like, what am I supposed to do? It's there. I get, I get really caught up between what I'm seeing from this, this, these eyes versus what I'm believing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not far enough along that it's automatic. So I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. That, that's the crux of the difficulty of finding the middle way. That's exactly the question to ask. Exactly. And some of it is, you know, we're not going to know until we're enlightened. But functionally, functionally act from compassion. How you frame the world can be fed by your understanding of emptiness. So say okay. so you're acting from compassion, someone runs into the road, you run in after them, you, you save them. That is a story then that could feed your ego or feed your understanding of reality. 
you the savior. Now you could be triumphant savior, talk on all the local news medias, you know, get a get a makeover, be very excited about your new shiny heroic status. Is that a good event for you as a practitioner? Not if you're framing it that way. <laughs> Right. You know, but so what do you come away from that saying? Okay, let's say you did that. Yeah. Did that person really exist? Did that really happen? Is it yeah, really? Yeah, it all exists on the relative. Yeah. But the meaning you attribute to it is not so solid. It has meaning, but not from its own side. So you're you're tipping towards nihilism, is what you're doing. Okay. Which is totally normal and very happens to us all. You're tipping towards nihilism, which is if it doesn't exist inherently, it doesn't exist at all, right? We're saying it doesn't exist inherently because it dependently arises. So countless causes and conditions brought this event about. Countless causes and conditions condition the way I label it. Mm -hmm. So still label it and let go. We have to label, we will label, we intuitively, spontaneously label, but you label loosely, knowing only from one set of perspectives, does this feel like truth? So then afflictions don't have room to get in. So you can think, I'm glad I had compassion that spontaneously arose to save this person. And whether that was good or that was bad, ultimately in the grand scheme of things is beyond my ability to comprehend, but I'm glad I acted from compassion but I'm not going to identify as this heroic, compassionate person because I know my compassion was learned. I had a fundamental compassion, like all sentient beings have, but then it was nurtured by this and this and this and this through series of lifetimes in this lifetime. So isn't it great? Compassion exists, but I'm not taking such excessive ownership and identification with it that it makes my pride explode. So then you're content rather than excited, you know, then you're at peace, you know, rather than over identified. Yeah. And so say you rush into traffic and you're too late and the person is crushed by a bus. You could use that as ammunition for your depression and feelings of self-loathing and failure and this and this and this, or you could think whether it's good or it's bad is beyond my ability to ken. Their next life might be even better. Yeah. I might've cut short a life of great suffering or their life might have had great potential, and it's really a shame it was cut short. But what it all means is far more complex and nuanced than my afflicted, ignorant mind wants to kind of brand it. So let it be spacious. And you make a prayer. When we meet again, may it be of benefit. Oh. Plant the karmic seed, let it go. So functionally operate from compassion, but yeah. when you frame it in your mind, use the awareness yeah. of emptiness. Okay, that's good. Excellent. Thank you very much. So a lot of these thoughts are like quiet thoughts by yourself during downtime. But then when you're walking around, you don't need to overthink it. Let, let your study and practice and meditation condition your daily life in such a way that you're more spontaneously compassion qualified with wisdom. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because if you're like overthinking all the time, then you'll be paralyzed with indecision because you don't know all of the pieces of any puzzle. How do you even act? How do you ever move? How do you make a choice or a decision about anything? You can get crazy. Yeah. But in a quiet moment, just thinking something as simple as what are all the parts of this one piece of fabric? You know, what are all the parts, all the threads, all the workmanship, all of the dye, all of the, you know, the, the story of the cotton that it came from, blah, 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 blah. And yet it's warm and I can use it. You know, so you kind of go into this massive elaboration of, wow, and on the atomic and subatomic level and what is form anyway. And also it keeps me warm, <laughs> you know, so then you don't get too weird about it, right? Delicate. It's so delicate. Okay, so in order to understand emptiness, for us, it's more helpful to look at it via dependent arising. So things are empty because they're dependent, dependent. So dependent arising means being created in dependence on other factors, such as causes and conditions and so refers to all impermanent phenomena. 
and the last two also refer to permanent phenomena. So the first one is causal dependency, which is the easiest to understand. Everything relies upon causes and conditions. So we can say causes are like the main thing and conditions are the supportive thing. So the main thing that is dictating your current mood is a karmic seed that you created in the past. Yeah, so if you're happy, if you're sad, if you're neutral, whatever you're feeling right now, the substantial cause is karma ripening from the past that you created. But what made it ripen, what watered the seed is the conditions of this moment. So the temperature in the room, the chair that you're sitting on, the sound of my voice, the pictures on the wall, et cetera, et cetera, countless causes and conditions watering that seed. Yeah, but the main thing was the seed that you created. But when you think about it, then what was more significant, the seed or the things that made the seed sprout? Well, in this moment, it's almost like they're of equal importance. Yeah, without the seed, there'd be no experience of that type. Without the watering and the fertilizing, there'd be no experience of that type. But in terms of the spiritual path, the seed is the most important thing. So how do you create more and more positive seeds to go from happiness to happiness to happiness to full enlightenment? And it's in not rocket science, you do what is of benefit right? You work for the welfare of all sentient beings. You have an altruistic mind, an empathic mind, a compassionate mind. And also, what is a compassionate act? Suddenly, you're like calling it into question. Yeah, giving food to the hungry, is it a compassionate act or is it an enabling act? Depends on the context, right? So you still do it, but you do it with eyes wide open you still, you find more information, right? You're not just taking it for granted that you know what the whole story is. Yeah, so thinking that everything is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. For example, it's dependent upon causes and conditions. So the wooden table needed wood. The conditions were the carpenter and the nails and the construction process, et cetera, and the invention of tables. Yeah, causes and conditions. So it's not a table from its own side. It's not a good mood from its own side. Nothing came about independently because it came about dependently. So does that level make sense just kind of logically in your mind? Yeah, everything's reliant on causes and conditions or at least all impermanent things are reliant on causes and conditions. You know, like on the surface, it's not that hard, but when you're sort of thinking about it practically, you can be a little bit more detailed in your analysis. Okay, causes and conditions. Right, so that really boils down to like a lot of the work that we might value in historians. You know, historians can tell us when this and this and this and this happens in a country, you get this and this and this result. We've seen it repeated over time. So these causes and conditions usually lead to these results. You know, that's helpful to be able to examine. We, when you think about scientists, they talk about cause and effect all the time. And it's still often in the level of theory because you never know every single cause unless you're absolutely clairvoyant and omniscient. But you can, you know, start to make an educated guess. And even at our level, we can start to make an educated guess. Giving food to the hungry is a good thing, but not divorced from context. That's a healthy way of engaging with dependent arising and compassion. Yeah. So then you think, all right, this organization seems to empower people who are living in poverty. This organization seems to just throw money at the problem, but doesn't follow through. All right. So I'll choose this one. But it's not like you're saying, because it's not perfect or not perfectly understood, I'm not going to give any food to the hungry. You know, it's empty. It doesn't matter. Right? Do you feel the distinction? Yeah. Questions on that one? Question? So um, you talk about seeds and cause and conditions. So everything is in the 12 lanes. 
So the big lines is the top of it. So if we, we can see it and understand emptiness, and then we can cut everything. And so we can liberate ourselves from, from our death and rebirth and the circle of the traveling. That yes. yes. So, um, so she's talking about the 12 links of dependent arising, this image that you're maybe familiar with. And it starts up here with describing how samsara or cyclic existence works. So the first one is ignorance, and then consciousness, and then karmic formations. And so what's happening is that, or excuse me, ignorance, karmic formations, then consciousness. So karmic formations is kind of the, the causes and conditions being created. Yeah. The substantial cause is, you know, the ignorance and the karmic formations planting a seed on the consciousness. And that will ripen into name and form, six sources and contact. So these three are the causes. These three are the conditions that water it, feeling, grasp, craving, and grasping. They're the, the, the conditions that water the causes. And then name and form six sources, these are the results. So the 12 links are in a certain order, but they can also be rearranged into which are the ones that are causes, which are the ones that are results, which are the ones that are afflictions. And sometimes that can be a little bit easier to get your head around when you're looking at dependent arising. So for us, what we want to do is realize we already have name and form and six sources, and we're coming into contact with all different kinds of things. This division here between contact and feeling is important to acknowledge, that what I come into contact with has an impact on how I feel. And when I feel something, Habituation makes me crave for more that is pleasant or crave to be separated from what is unpleasant. So what I want to do is to start working with what do I come into contact with that I have the strength to work with. When I have a feeling arise, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, what can I do to break the spell and break the habit of feeling leading to craving and grasping? which then becomes becoming birth, old age, and death, which are also results. So this is kind of like its own teaching. And so if you're not familiar with that teaching, just kind of put it aside for now. But those of you that are used to the teaching on the 12 links of dependent arising, really the place of work for us is between feeling and craving. So you feel something pleasant, you remember emptiness, and that stops the pleasant feeling from turning into attachment or turning into a reaction of attachment more precisely. Yeah, so then you can just enjoy without clinging. If you have an unpleasant feeling, physically or mentally, you remember that it's empty of inherent existence or any other strategy that you like, and that interrupts the habit of unpleasant, creating a reaction of aversion, anger, etc. So you're seeing that there's a difference between the way you feel and the way you respond. And that is a fundamental and profound lesson for all of us in our life, Buddhist or otherwise. How do I feel what I feel, acknowledge what I feel, don't suppress what I feel, but don't give it fuel to turn into something problematic? I have a just something to share from yesterday. I don't know if it's helpful, but, and, and also kind of a statement on what I need to work on, you know, is I had a headache for a lot of yesterday, but I was able just to kind of um, feel it and not, you know, generate a lot of aversion. But then I was um, doing some caulking in the basement and my foot slipped and touched the area that I'd already caulked. And mm -hmm. like my eye, notice how I'd messed up the clocking. So I had the, the um, contact through the eye sense. And then immediately this strong feeling of aversion led to 
you know, unskillful words. And um, so it's like that momentary um, feeling that surprises you that those are the really hard ones to um, uh, work with. So more practice. <laughs> Yeah, but also fuel for practice, you know, like we're not going to be perfect and we're not even going to live up to our own study, <laughs> but it's like you use that then as fuel the next time, right, to sit and go, okay, here's how that led to that led to that. Here was the window of opportunity that I missed. Next time, I'm going to try not to miss it. What did it feel like in my body to give in to the negative state of mind? What did it feel like in my mind to give in to the habit of the negative state of mind? You know, and you just kind of unpack it once the dust settles and like give yourself some compassion and humor and feel connected to the human condition because you're certainly not alone. You know, it's 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 helpful to use those moments where you didn't succeed <laughs> in your practice to yeah. then ask, you know, what were what were the ingredients for that? Because it again, it's dependently arisen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So when you remember dependent arising, it, it completely takes away guilt and shame and blame and attributing fault. What it does is it gives you responsibility and accountability and interest and energy to practice without blame and identification and guilt and shame. Because you realize the action happened here, it happened you know, in the space I'm occupying through countless causes and conditions, but it happened here from me. So I need to take responsibility for it, but I didn't do any action alone, good or bad. No one ever has. So no one's truly to blame, but there are a few pieces that are more accountable, if that makes sense. And so then it makes us less defensive if someone says, oh, what you said to me the other day was really harsh and it really hurt my feelings. You can think, all right, from a certain perspective, I can see how that might have landed that way, even if from my perspective, those words weren't particularly harsh. From your perspective, they were. It's true for you. Or, yeah, you're right, I was grumpy, I lashed out. You know, whatever the case may be, you realize many, many things came together for this event to be labeled this way. Then you just operate from a place of compassion without needing to defend yourself or explain yourself. You understand it's nuanced. Yeah, it's interesting. So let's have a, a 10 minute break and, um, and then we'll do a little meditation. And uh, the last two points of dependent arising, I'll just quickly go through, but um, have a 10 minute break. Okay. So we'll just briefly look at the last two levels of dependent arising and then do a meditation. So the last two are, again, there's like a level that I think you can immediately understand. And then there's a lot of nuance and detail that maybe you just need to sit with for a bit. But I think it's interesting to look at the different layers of subtlety. So we talk about reliant or dependent on causes and conditions. That was the first layer, and that refers to impermanent things. And then both permanent and impermanent things have what is called mutual dependency. So they rely on parts and or context. And so this one I think is interesting. It's like the result relies upon the cause, the cause relies upon the result. You can only call it a cause, because it has a corresponding result, vice versa. But also much more simply, you can just think in terms of like near and far. The concept of near only exists in contrast to the idea of far. Or this room in my house being the big room is only because the other rooms in this house are smaller. But compared to the room you're in, it's a small room. You know, it exists in context, right? And those things are not emotionally loaded or particularly problematic until you have a story with it. You know, it could be, this is my big room and you have your bigger room. Now I feel bad because my room isn't as big as yours. <laughs> now it's got a story. Now it's got a recipe for a negative emotion. Now there's a recipe for negative karmic seeds being developed and suffering to happen in the future. 
but if I just think rawly, this is only a big room in contrast to the other rooms in my house. It's a small room in contrast to your big room. It exists in a context. It's value neutral in that way. Then you just let it go. So then what about behavior? <laughs> behavior is much trickier. Like, I think, for example, something like swearing, okay? Something like swearing, is it good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? It depends on context, doesn't it? Like, I used to live in Australia. Australians swear like sailors. They just, they swear, the Australians. And, you know, and I was uh, a young person when I moved to Australia. I was 19, and I was just sort of, like, maturing out of my swearing stage right? Like I was letting it go and I was trying to be a grown up and speak a little bit more, you know, politely. And, um, and then all these Australians are swearing like sailors. At first, I thought, oh my God, they're so rude. They're so rude. Oh, you know, <laughs> until I realized that's just the way they talk. And actually, if they're swearing, it usually means they're relaxed because they're able to be candid with you and just kind of speak freely. So those same words from someone in America would have been incredibly rude and probably loaded and full of aggression in Australia were actually very good natured, very candid in a way of communicating relaxation and ease. Context, same words, different context, different meaning. Yeah, do you know what I mean, right? So when you're looking at behavior, again, you have to be so delicate because you don't want this way of thinking to go at the expense of ethics. Negative destructive behaviors are to be avoided. <laughs> Positive constructive behaviors are to be developed. But what those mean is very context specific. And so you live and you act as kindly and ethically and wisely as you can, while at the same time knowing these behaviors are going to land differently for different people in different times. So I have no control really over people's reaction. I can just make an educated guess. Yeah, in New Zealand, they want me to speak slowly and sweetly. In Israel, they want me to speak fast and humorously. Yeah, you can make those general assumptions and stereotypes sometimes exist for a reason but you also have to acknowledge them as stereotypes and trends, meaning not always so, not always the case. Yeah, and the brain loves to find patterns, doesn't it? We love to find patterns. We wanna be able to plan. We wanna have reassurance. We want stability. This is this and that is that. And dependent arising just flips that on its head and says, in a certain context, sort of. <laughs> And then how do you live in the world when things are so spacious? Function from compassion, remember emptiness with your frame. Does that make sense? So use simple things that are easy, like near and far and big and small, you know, dark and light, outside, inside. You know, these things you can see there's a mutual dependency. The concept of one depends on the concept of the other. And one can't exist without the existence of the other. Yeah. We can also look at it from the perspective of parts. And this is where it gets subtle and closer to your own relationship to your identity, parts. So if you look at a house, it's obvious to see that a house is labeled in dependence upon its parts. There's a door, there's walls, there's frames, there's a roof, there's a foundation, independence upon all of the parts you label house. But where is the house? Where is the house? You point to anything that seems like house, you're pointing to a part. I can say, this is the house. No, that's a wall. <laughs> a wall is not the house. It's one of the parts that you label house independence upon. You're like, oh, that's the house. No, that's a window. <laughs> yeah, a window is a part that you, is one of the parts that you can label house independence upon. There is no house separate from its parts. If you got rid of all the parts, there would be no house there holding it all together magically, right? So that's an easy enough mental exercise, but then think about the self, your own self. 
also labeled independence upon parts. Then it becomes more subtle. So that's where we get into the conversation about the five aggregates. So I'll just show you guys that briefly. We talked about this earlier in the piece about how all phenomena are empty, but they're divided into permanent and impermanent. And then impermanent is divided into form and consciousness and non-associated composites. So non-associated composites are neither form nor consciousness like a person. The person is labeled in dependence upon these five aggregates or parts. So a self is a non-associated composite and the five aggregates are the parts, the, the basis upon which we label self or I or me. And these five aggregates are samsara. They are cyclic existence. Yeah, they are under the control of and bound by karma and disturbing emotions. So samsara feels like it's out there, but it's actually this. So <clears throat> the aggregates or heaps, they're five perishable or changeable composites that act as the basis of designation of I. So you have form, and that's easy. That's the body. Then you have feeling, physical and mental feelings or sensations, right? Good, bad, or I should say pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Then you have recognition or discernment or discrimination, it's sometimes called. This is your ability to discern between this and that. This is space, that's a solid, you know, your ability to discern. Then you have formation or compositional factors. And that's basically all of the other mental factors, like intention, where you create karma. And then the final one is consciousness or primary consciousness, which we talked about in the first class, I think about how it's clarity and awareness. And so these five aggregates, they exist, right? There's no one saying they don't exist. They exist, but they are not the self. They are the basis upon which you label self. Is the body the self? No. Are your feelings self? No. Is your ability to discern self? No. Are all your other mental thoughts, all your other emotions, all of your other mental factors self? No. Is consciousness self? No. They're all parts upon which you label self. They're parts upon which you label self. And that distinction is really important. Because when we're saying there is no inherently existent self, it starts to sound like there's no self at all. There is a self. There's a self that's labeled in dependence upon those parts. That's the relative self. The ultimate self is that lacking inherent existence. So sometimes in Buddhism, you'll read like no self, no self, no this, no that. It's a shortcut way of saying not inherently existent this, or not all by itself this, or not free from parts this. Yeah, there is a self. There's a self labeled independence upon the parts. And so then you can start to feel kind of reassured and secured. Oh, I am my parts. No, <laughs> you're labeled independence upon your parts. Anything that you start to become concrete about also has parts. For, for example, a beginning, a middle, and an end, temporal parts. Yeah, or it's labeled independence upon contrasting it from other experience. So feeling can be labeled in contrast to discernment. Feeling feels, mm -hmm. discernment discerns. They're not the same thing, but you can see the contrast. But both exist, both are functioning with you. So you're holding the idea of self in this really gentle way, this spacious way that acknowledges the ability for transformation. It can be hugely empowering to think in these terms. How many people have lost happiness, mental health, even their lives because they over-identified with the body? And so then if the body didn't meet societal standards of handsomeness and attractiveness and beauty, then they hate the self because they think the self is the body and people's projections about the body are truth. And then they don't eat enough and then they die. 
yeah or they exercise themselves and take all sorts of steroids and go crazy with performing what the body should look like in order to get the kind of response they want because the body is the self they think you can lose your whole life to that yeah if you were very attractive when you were young and then as you get older people don't think you're attractive it could feel like you're losing something of yourself but the self is not the body so you can see how each of these becomes really empowering because you can feel the way in which all of it exists dependently therefore it's empty of inheritance oh, what a relief yeah so if you're feeling you know sophisticated in your philosophical thinking and you've let go of the idea that your body is you it's just one of the parts that you label you on but it itself has many parts and perspectives and blah 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 then you can start to think that you're one of the mental factors you can start to think i am feeling feeling is me and everything else is a piece of me it's easy to kind of like get stuck on one of those aggregates and think that's the boss or that's the identity and then you realize that each of those are dependent on other feeling is dependent on the conditions it came into contact with together with its previous conditioning together with how discernment labeled it together with what the body met with it etc 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 feeling is not the boss or the self it's one aspect that you label self on and then you can think oh well then i must be the primary consciousness haha -ha, i'm a winner of philosophy i must be the consciousness i and consciousness are the same no <laughs> consciousness exists in dependence upon the experiences of the mental factors and what it comes into contact with etc 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 but it exists and so you start to see that each of these parts has parts has parts has parts kind of ad nauseum but not into nothingness almost into infinite partness and then interdependentness and then where i stop and you begin becomes very abstract but you know that on in the relative it can be quite obvious i stop where my body stops you begin where your body begins on the relative that kind of works out but you know ultimately it's way more complicated than that and that your experience is dependent on me and my experience is dependent on you and that if one of us was missing we'd be having a different experience of selfness so who am i anyway and so you just let it live in this interesting creative space of infinite possibility and come to the conclusion may i be the most positive condition wherever i am and let go of feeling i can control everything so all of this complicated philosophy you just coalesce into a simple thought for yourself like may i be of greatest benefit yeah to the collective <laughs> to the interconnected net may i bring the greatest benefit and then let go however you want to frame that to yourself so you know get as complicated as you want when you're in an intellectual sort of analysis about this and then let it rest on some tangible truth you know to be true in your life from your life experience like and therefore compassion is always a good idea right and therefore patience is key or whatever whatever framing works for you how does that land yeah go ahead um uh, earlier you showed two slides um and the first one was like this flow diagram um I think it was permanent, impermanent, and uh, then um, neither, uh, you know, the five aggregates were described as neither form nor consciousness. Yeah. Uh, uh, not, not such, come, neither form nor consciousness. But then within the five aggregates, you have form and consciousness. So is it like both is, that's the point of what you're saying. It's not, not one or the other, it's both. They're like a conglomerate a conglomerate or something 
Yeah, it's a it's a debate structure framing. So it sounds weird to say non-associated composites are neither form nor consciousness when a self is labeled in dependence upon form and consciousness. It's a weird framing. Um, it's a good framing to get used to because you'll see it everywhere in the philosophical texts. But it's it's sort of to say if something is both, it can't be either one. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And really, it's labeled independence upon both, you know, a subtle distinction. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I don't really understand about the compositional factor. Could you uh, use an example on that? Is that action, intention? What is the comp uh, compositional factors? Yeah, in the five aggregates, it's sometimes called formation or compositional factors. Sometimes formation helps you understand better. It's kind of like how, how experience is formed, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Basically, it's all the other mental factors. So we pull out feeling and discrimination as very important mental factors or states of mind. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones, like every other emotion you could possibly think of if you put it in colloquial terms. And you pile them all together in this like grab bag of, of mental experiences and call it compositional factors. So if you wanted to kind of get an experience of it, the main one, probably in that big, huge list of mental factors, intention. Yeah, so in compositional factors, the probably the most important one is intention, and that's where karma is created yes. for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a whole a whole topic called minds and mental factors, which is really interesting. And they talk about the 51 main mental factors, right? And there are things like mindfulness and attention and um, you know, non-attachment, non-hatred also the afflictions like it's a whole you know categorized list of things but we wouldn't say we don't usually use the word emotion to describe mental factors even though some of the mental factors are what we would call colloquially emotions just because the buddhist understanding of the mind is a little bit different than the psychological understanding yeah but basically you know roughly you could say all the other millions of emotions you could ever have go in that pile in that aggregate compositional factors yeah but mainly intention yeah so um mutual dependency rely on parts and or context and then this most subtle is merely label dependency so all things are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise for example they arise in dependence upon mind's imputation on a valid basis yeah there's a valid basis of designation and there's a mind's imputation or labeling on it so things existing in dependence upon the mind and a valid basis both then you start to ask who's mind what mind what's a valid basis and that becomes another conversation but generally we say a valid basis is something that doesn't go against worldly convention, not worldly conventions that attribute value, but worldly conventions that are coarser than that, like hard and space. Yeah, like something that's solid and something that's space, or liquid and solid, or hot and cold. These are worldly conventions. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what language we're talking about. All languages have some concept for hot and cold, right? These are worldly conventions. So these worldly conventions are what we call a valid base. And then the mind labeling upon them, those two things make it a dependent arising from that subtlest perspective. So then you start to think about those Zen koans, you know, like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? You've heard this Zen koan? Or what is the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah. Now you start to understand what those Zen koans are trying to get you to think of. Is there a sound without someone to hear it? Is there sound without someone to hear it? Yeah, there's the valid base, but there's no mental imputation. You need both. Yeah, what is sound, you know? It's interesting. 
to play with because you're like no surely there is sound even if no one hears it it's doing the thing and the thing and the science and the whatever but is it what is sound does it have to go in this way interesting what is the sound of one hand clapping well you need another hand to make a sound anyway it's interesting to look at the dependent arising of things in a like deep philosophical way or in a poetic way that evokes some kind of experience whatever works for you but Practically, what I do, I don't know if this works for you, this is the advice of one of our teachers, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, is if you're feeling really sure of an opinion, and it's the sort of opinion that is a catalyst for a negative state of mind, like you've read something on the news and you think it's bad and that's making you angry, you know, one of those sequences, to add at the end of your opinion, merely labeled by the mind. Yeah, you're like, how dare people do that? That is so outrageous, merely labeled by the mind. It kind of softens the potential for that turning into anger. Then you have the opinion, and you can have your opinion, but you're having it in much more a spacious way. Yeah, and then it doesn't have the power to disturb your peace. Questions about those. Mutual dependency and mere designation. Does that make sense, at least on one level? And then if it makes sense, do you agree? <laughs> right, first step, does it make sense? If it makes sense, do you agree? If you agree, what will you do with it? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a beginner, right? So for me, I think the synthesis I'm taking away from the things that I've learned today is um, reminding myself not to get hooked into what should be or what shouldn't be, and maybe be with what is. Hmm. So, um, and I find that there's compassion there, and there's more peace. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And the question, what is sometimes? Is it really? Is it? Well, but but that's that's back to the thing about how like you're in the grocery store and there really is a grocery store. Right? Yeah. Yep. And and I think where I get hooked is, you know, well, you know, there shouldn't be screaming children. There should be home by the parents or you know, like I get hooked in that story rather than just being present to what is as in that's what I'm experiencing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it creates a good kind of relaxed, neutral space, for sure. And, and you know, and then if you're feeling really ambitious, you can think, what is grocery store? <laughs> you know, <laughs> who am I? But if you can at least do this, is, you know, should or shouldn't, that is already pro level work that if all people did at least that level, we'd be so much more relaxed and accommodating of each other and just civilized, right? <laughs> Um, so if we can at least unpack what is should and what is shouldn't and how do these things come about and how do I label them and what is truth anyway and just kind of play with that. And then you re rest in it is many things at once merely labeled by the mind. <laughs> and then what is the grocery store? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> but don't do that when you get in the car and drive. Pause <laughs> and then get in the car and drive. <laughs> No, it's interesting. And, you know, sometimes the other traditions um, in Tibetan Buddhism, especially, talk about kind of trying to have a non-dual experience. Non-dual in the sense of subject, you, object, quote, out there stuff, not being as separate as your ignorance projects. So if I want to have a non-dual experience with my cup of coffee, then I can think, okay, here's me over here and cup of coffee in there. And the non-dual experience can be triggered by having a sip, swallowing it, and feeling like we become one, the perceiver and the perceived. 
And when you ingest something like food, it's much easier to have kind of a non-dual experience because you know there's like a digestive process happening. But what if it's something you hear? You know, so right now I hear my cat is trying to get into a bag of snacks. I'm gonna have to deal with that later. And that sound of the bag rustling in the background could be annoying, could be neutral, could be endearing, right? It could be any number of things. But how about I let go of all that and think, how do I make it non-dual? How about I reach my hearing to that sound and then that sound coming back into my ears, feeling like subject and object dissolve into non-duality, which then is kind of a peaceful, happy place of some kind of oneness. But don't do it while you're driving, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? It's, it's, that's another way to sort of play with these concepts is perceiver and perceived or subject and object. How do I make these experiences be felt as kind of a non-dual experience? We know that it's a mental exercise at our level, but often the philosophical text will say everything is one taste and emptiness. In emptiness, everything is one taste. But that doesn't mean they all taste the same. And that's kind of helping you understand the relative. So everything can be one taste without them all tasting the same. One taste of non-duality. One taste of the like merging or dissolving of the idea of subject and object. But still coffee tastes different than tea. Music sounds different than the bag rustling. But they can all have the same experience of infinite interconnectedness. And the felt experience of infinite interconnectedness is peace because it doesn't make sense to go to war with anything that's a part of you or connected to you. It would be like the hand having a war with the foot. You know, the hand and the foot aren't the same, but there's an understanding of a connected system. So then me being annoyed at my neighbors doesn't make sense anymore. It's like the hand being mad at the foot. Yeah, we're not the same, but we're so connected. It's as if we're part of one whole. So then compassion isn't something you have to fabricate or make happen. It's just what you release into because it's the only thing that makes sense. Just like if you hurt your foot, your hand goes to comfort it. Automatically, without thinking, your hand comforts your foot if you hurt it. You don't have to think, what has the foot done for me? What's the suffering of the foot? All right, let's talk it through. Let's try and like find some empathy for the foot. You don't have to overthink it. It's, your, it's part of the same system. You just go to comfort it. And then the hand doesn't want repayment later. Like you never do anything for me, foot. You know, that's absurd. So when you understand the interconnectedness, compassion just arises spontaneously. Right now, we have to think it through sometimes. Sometimes now it doesn't come automatically, but when we realize emptiness, it's in the flow to respond with non-harmfulness always and to try and work for the benefit always. And then it's like the two wings become one, method and wisdom. Any, any questions before we do a little meditation on this? We'll sit then. So just get yourself into a nice posture, straight back. And just be with your body for a minute. And if it helps, you can take a few intentional breaths, nice and deep.
And then set a motivation thinking, I'm going to meditate on emptiness in order to understand it better and to see if I can apply it to my own life in a way that can cut negative habits. Maybe even the most fundamental habit of ignorance, which leads to anger and attachment and all of samsara. May I break the wheel. And so start with a question, who am I, where am I? And see if you can just feel into that experience without coming to too much of a definitive conclusion. Just explore, who am I, where am I? Who am I might feel like the thoughts in your head. Where am I might feel like the place your body occupies. And you can let that be true relatively. But start to investigate further. What is the body? Where is the body? And it might feel obvious the body is here where I'm seating. But where exactly? The legs? The seat? The back? The shoulders? The head? body is just labeled in dependence upon all of these parts. It might feel like, oh, maybe the body is the core and the limbs are just extra parts. But the core is made of so many muscles and organs. Which organ? is the body. Is it the stomach? Is it the heart, the lungs? How many organs could be missing before there's no longer an animate body here? And so relatively, the body is here, merely labeled on the collection of parts. But ultimately, there is no body that exists from its own side, in and of itself. Body is merely labeled by the mind on the valid basis of the parts. All of the parts are changing moment to moment. How could this body be the self?
And so know your body, feel the experience of being in the body. And shift to finding the mind. Where is the mind? What is the mind? Is the mind the self? Just exploring that. Mind. Is the mind the brain or the nervous system or the gut biome or all or none of those? Maybe the mind uses those but is not them. Is the mind the thoughts, the words in the head? But sometimes there is obviously consciousness without words. Quiet moments were a time when we were pre-verbal. The words and thoughts are a part of the mind, but not the mind. Where is the mind? Maybe it's the mood. Maybe it's the energy level. But already those are separate things. Good mood, bad mood, neutral mood. Like weather in the sky. Changing constantly. Dependent on so many factors. So much from the past. So much in the present influencing the mood of the mind. How could it be one thing? How could it be self? Or maybe it's the feelings and sensations Maybe it's the part that moves away or towards different ideas or stimuli. And the more you explore, the more pieces there are. And the more intricate the interdependence. And so mind itself is labeled independence upon its parts. It's the primary consciousnesses, the mental factors. The relationship they have to the body, particularly the brain and nervous system and gut biome. But in the vast landscape of all of those parts related to consciousness, is there one tiny piece in amongst it all that we call self? That's a definable individual I, me. Just 
check. And anything that feels like a core, independent, completely autonomous self, unrelated to the rest, check it more deeply. Anything that feels like self is usually just another mental factor like intention, our choices, decisions, or is our feelings, or our responses to them, or what we're focused on, or what we decide it means. So there is no self separate from all of these parts. Self is labeled independence upon all of them. All of them interconnected. All of them completely dependent on countless other causes and conditions. And the mind itself lacking inherent existence. That is our true nature. One facet that's unchanging is this potential, this absence of inheritance, this space of possibility, potent potential, which can develop into perfection. And so dedicate by thinking, may that development occur. May I purify and educate and develop my mind to its utmost extent in order to bring greatest happiness and well being to both myself and others. May all sentient beings become enlightened. You can relax your attention. So in the book, Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions, there's some nice explanations. There's also a nice book called Emptiness by Geshe Teshi Sering that I recommend. And so um, if you want to learn more, this book, Emptiness by Geshe Teshi Sering, um, goes into a nice amount of detail, but in clear language that's uh, easy enough to understand if you give it enough space and time. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, dedicate the merit of the class. Thanks everybody for hanging in there. I know it was a lot of words and thoughts, especially if they were new, but um, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> E panyam pa me bayam, gone gone do pelshu, on he dawar in boche, mark e panyam pa me bayam, gone gone do pelshu. Okay.
Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Jonathan. Please come again. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.